She was born Anna Segeti in Budapest, Hungary, experienced the 1956 revolution there, and even as a five-year-old child spent time in jail because of it. A decade later, she came to Canada, founded her own book publishing business, married a lawyer who was part of the Tory establishment, and eventually sat on boards with the likes of Margaret Thatcher, Henry Kissinger, and Conrad Black. That incredible journey is chronicled in her new memoir. It's called, In Other Words, How I Fell in Love with Canada, One Book at a Time, and it brings Anna Porter to our studio. So nice to have you back here. Nice to be back. We're going to tell the story of your life here, which starts, um, can I say this, kind of sad. Um, you barely knew your father growing up in Hungary. Why yeah. was that? The Russians were bombarding the city, and he went out to get some uh, fresh bread, if he could find it, and he was picked up um, along with a whole bunch of other people and by Russian soldiers who were occupying uh, bits of Budapest at that point. And he was taken off to Siberia, and he spent the next uh, two and a half years in, uh, in the Gulag, in a place called Vorkuta. So in your formative years, you had practically no experience with him at all? Actually, I had pretty much no experience of him during all of the rest well, of my Well, we're going to talk about that. Years. We are going to talk about it in a second. I mentioned in the intro you got arrested as a five-year-old kid. How did that happen? Oh, I was about four or five. Mm. And uh, my mother decided to try and follow my father, who had come back from the Gulag. Uh, there were a general release of uh, most of the Hungarians from that camp and uh, they were shipped back by train, or trained back. Mm. And uh, he, uh, he, he got out of Hungary as quickly as he could, and my mother thought we should follow. So he went to Vienna and uh, was ostensibly waiting there. I don't know, I never asked him if he really was waiting there. And my mother and I uh, attempted to cross the border and were arrested by uh, the border guards and uh, put into uh, detention camp. Now, five year old, a five-year-old is probably old enough to remember this. Do, do oh, you? Oh, I do. I you remember it very clearly. Yes. Huh? Were you terrified? Um, actually, I, I, I wasn't. Oddly enough, hmm. um, I, I was terrified of the interrogation. They interrogated me about my family, um, and the the only part of that that I was scared of was strobe lights. They had very, very strong. I don't know if there were strobe lights, but they were bright, bright lights in my face. And it did, I don't know how long it lasted. They wanted to know about my father and about my mother and whether or not they were um, anti-communist agitators. Mm. And uh, um, I yep, answered as best as I could. And the, uh, the officers who were in charge of the interrogation started to feel really badly about it. So I got an apple and some chocolate, and they took me back to the cell. And really, the rest of the time, I was only there a few weeks. Uh, my mother stayed. Uh, she was condemned for trying to get out of the country, and uh, she stayed for uh, eight months. But eventually, you did get out and moved yes. to New Zealand. Of all places. Of my all mom places. was hoping for somewhere far away from Hungary, and I don't think you could get much farther away than New Zealand. And your father did not go with you? No, he, uh, he, he remarried. Uh, they never reunited. Uh, my parents never reunited. So. And eventually from New Zealand to Canada. How did that work out? Um, I, I uh, Sadly, I, I found New Zealand was wonderful and, and really pretty and lovely. And, you know, you can look at the mountains and the ocean and everything. But I found it actually profoundly boring <laughs> once I grew up to tell the difference between uh, really interesting uh, people and, and, and not terribly interesting people in beautiful countryside. So I wanted to get out and uh, moved to London, actually, uh, rather than here, and worked there in book publishing. Although the fact that we're doing this interview in English, you can thank New Zealand for, right? Absolutely. And it, it, New Zealand was kind to me, it took me in, educated me, you know, really, and, and gave my mother a perfectly fine new husband, a lovely man, alas, now no longer around. But he was a very fine person, I think, overall, although I didn't like him. but that I wasn't going to like anybody. I was, I was in my teens, and I was kind of surly. Well, eventually, as you have just hinted in that last answer, eventually you got into the book publishing business, and you, when you came to Canada, you hooked up with one of the most intriguing and extraordinary and controversial and difficult men in the history of publishing in this country. And we have a lot of people who are new Canadians who watch this program, and the name Jack McClellan will mean nothing to them. 
So you need to start by telling us why he was so unique. He was, um, he was a, a war veteran. He was absolutely fearless. Um, he had, um, he was in love with Canada and Canadian writers in particular. And he believed, as I do uh, now, and slowly began to realize he was right, that Canadian writers are as good as, and in many cases, better than writers in other countries who are celebrated. And Canadian writers in those days were not celebrities. Mm -hmm. And he made Canadian writers into celebrities. And I think that is, that was something nobody else had done here. And you know what? Uh, it was the right time. It was the very end of the 60s when I got here, uh, post-Expo. Uh, there was a whole new kind of consciousness. Canadians were beginning to be proud of their country. Uh, we did a good thing at Expo. We did really well. Mm. Uh, the rest of the world was paying attention. And Jack McClelland, who was really my hero uh, for a very, you know, right up until the end of his days, um, I thought he was an extraordinary person, a genius, really. Uh, publisher, magnificently impressive, persuasive person who could really appear anywhere and talk pretty much anybody into believing, sharing his enthusiasm for, you know, not thinking back for new Canadians. Um, sadly, Pierre Burton may not mean very much, but in those days, uh, Jack McClelland could sell 300,000 copies of a Pierre Burton That's book. That's extraordinary. Pierre and Burton popularized really, history in this country. Absolutely. Working for Jack McClelland, or working with Jack McClelland, I guess. Uh, Margaret Atwood sold 150,000 copies of Survival, a book yes. about literary criticism. And yet, this company of his, McClelland and Stewart, always seemed to be on the edge of a financial precipice about to go over. Why was that? Um, sadly, the people he was unable to convince with his overwhelming enthusiasm and his persuasive ways that Canadian writing was magnificent and that we should really all believe in it and promote it and, and spend our money buying books, sadly, were the bankers. Hmm. I don't know if that's changed at all. Um, it hasn't. Yeah. I, I, I actually remember the time that our banker, years later, of the company that I ran, um, having insisted that I double the key person insurance policy, said, Mrs. Porter, at this point, you're worth more to us dead than alive. <laughs> uh, that's a funny thing to hear from a banker. Well, it, yeah. yes. I actually, you know what? I cracked up. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the reaction they were looking for. You, you, I mean, you clearly love Jack McClellan, but on the other hand, he, he ticked you off a lot, including because he refused to pay you as much as the men who worked at that company earned as well, right? Yes. And he, you made a stink yes, about it. I did. And he didn't do anything about it. No. He, he now, didn't. why didn't you quit? I loved where I was. And, uh, and, and, and my love of what I was doing really outweighed um, my disappointment that I couldn't get a raise. Hmm. And people, men, even at sort of lower levels of the company were, were making more than I was. And, but I, I felt it was a privilege to work there. Mm. And, and it felt like a privilege. Well, how, you know, what other job can you imagine where you could um, have breakfast with, we mentioned Pierre Burton, and then have a meeting with uh, Farley Mowat over mm. his next book, and then maybe go and visit Margaret Lawrence at her um, at her, as she called it, shack on the Otanabe <laughs> River, yeah. and then come back and have dinner with uh, Margaret Atwood. I mean, what other possible job? And so many people really do jobs that they hate. And you loved yours. I, I loved it. All of us yeah. at McClellan and Stewart, all of us, uh, loved and felt that we were doing something important. Mm. I want to get back to the angle about your father, because as you pointed out in that first answer, your father never really did come back into your life. However, and Sheldon, we're going to put the excerpt of the book up here from the middle of page three. At one point in the 1970s, somebody tells you your father is living in Winnipeg under a different name. And here's how you describe it. I think I called at least four times before I found my voice. He denied all knowledge of a daughter, all knowledge of Hungary, my mother, 
his time in the Gulag. He claimed he was born here in Canada. He made this claim with a heavy Hungarian accent, not so different from how my grandfather sounded after 20 years of trying to learn English. Eventually, he did fess up. You arrived on his doorstep, and you met him. How did that go? Um, he, by then, had admitted, oddly enough, not to me, but to Jack McLennan, that indeed he did have a daughter. Mm. Uh, Jack phoned, impersonating a Time magazine reporter. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those things. I, I told Jack the story. We're sitting in a bar in Winnipeg. It was just after some publishing event. And Jack said, are you kidding me? He's in Winnipeg? Hang on a second. <laughs> And he tracked him down and phoned him and said, I'm working for Time magazine, and we're doing a story about uh, your daughter who's uh, working for a guy called Jack McClelland, and uh, we'd like to interview you. And my father admitted that I was his daughter. Hmm. So when I arrived um, at... And Jack took me there in a cab to make sure that I actually went through with it because I was having second thoughts. And uh, there, you know, he was standing in the doorway um, looking, I had always imagined him to be somewhat heroic because Hungarian, you know, heroes. I, I grew up believing, believing in Hungarian heroes, you know. But he was this not particularly tall man, and he was, he had no hair to speak of. It was a little, little tuft of hair just above his, and it was white. And the only thing is that there was something about his eyes that I thought, geez, you know, he looks, I look like this. Hmm. And a uh, very ordinary apartment, very ordinary place. He, and you uh, did not hit it off? Not particularly, not particularly. but I, you know, it, it had, I had thought that over the years between when he went west and throughout my childhood, and particularly the time, I mean, I, my childhood wasn't all that bad, even though it was, you know, communism, it was really not great. but. I didn't have any standards of comparison. Mm -hmm. But in New Zealand, I was miserable. I was in a boarding school, and I wrote letters to my father thinking, you know, he might come and rescue me. None of this happened. Mm -hmm. And he sent no support payments, no chocolates, no at Christmas, no nothing. So all those years, he was obviously living in happy denial. And uh, so, yes, I was not... Um... Well, can I ask you the heavy follow-up question then? Yes. How much do you think your father's indifference to you messed you up? Probably irrevocably, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have, again, I have no standards of comparison. But I know a lot of people with a mother and father, and they're even more messed up than I am. But I, mm. I, I think that... Um, to some degree, maybe Jack McLennan was a kind of a father figure, mm. you know, because he was also a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandfather stood in instead of my father. He was sort of the male in the family. Mm. And he, he and I were very, very close. And he was a great storyteller, just, you know, brimming over with fantastic tales of dragons and witches and, and heroic Hungarians, as I mentioned before, although, frankly, as I discovered from my reading a little bit later, um, Hungarians generally lost most of the battles that they were in. So uh, Heroically, though. Oh, absolutely <clears throat> heroically. Indeed. And, you know, so he, I had a, a father figure uh, at that point, and I think, you know, Jack, to some degree, because he taught me everything really about publishing. He was also a kind of father figure, so I tended to, to, be, to overlook hmm. things like not getting paid enough. Well, I wonder if you broke his heart a little bit when you decided to leave him and start your own publishing company, Key Porter, in 1982. How did he take to that? Um, he was okay, I think, by the time I started my own company. Um, I left him first, and I was hoping to get a job doing something other than publishing. I mean, really, I, I approached people in television thinking this would be fun. Moses could, Neimer you approached. Uh, indeed, Fellow I refugee. did. Fellow in, refugee. Indeed, I tried a number, I, I talked to Peter Herendorf, and he didn't, he, he didn't even understand what I was talking about. He was, <laughs> really wanted to talk about the books that we were about to publish. Anyway, um, I was sort of at home for a while. I had a new baby. And the reason why, the reason I gave Jack for leaving was that 
uh, my job as editor-in-chief was a more than full-time. I was working seven days a week, and I had a tiny kid at home, and I had a new baby. And Jack's view of all that was, you know, you bring the baby in, and when you go to meetings, leave the baby here on the floor, which I did for a while. <laughs> but it just wasn't... I mean, Jack was not really a great babysitter. He did his best, but it wasn't working. Mm. And I had to I had to get out and, and, and be with my kids. So really, Key Porter started later. By that time, Jack had appointed an enormously capable woman called Linda McKnight, who had mm -hmm. previously worked uh, work, worked for me when I was editor-in-chief, and she was president. And uh, so he was kind of set, and he was not surprised that I went back into the book business. Hmm. So. Well, I want to read another excerpt here about one of the authors that you eventually published. She happens to be the mother of the current Prime Minister of Canada. When we first met in 1980, Margaret Trudeau was stunningly beautiful, in her mid-twenties, too young to be the mother of three little children, and much too young to be the wife of Canada's Prime Minister. Pierre Trudeau, despite all his dashing ways, was 30 years older and unable to share in her sense of fun, her lightness of being a former flower child. That 30-year age difference was one of the factors in their publicly failing marriage, but only one. Her resistance to the coddled, formulaic existence expected of the wife of a prime minister, his highly intellectual approach to problem solving, her desire to be free of constraints, her insensitivity to embarrassment, his natural superiority to those he regarded as intellectually less capable, most people, than he was, <laughs> his frequent long absences and his unrelenting work schedule all contributed to their breakup. How well did you know Margaret Trudeau? Well, I really only knew her um, well during the period of time that we were working on this uh, book together. Did you like her? I liked her very much. Um, I liked her, and I was really very sympathetic to her plight. Um, I, I, I really... I couldn't imagine how she was putting up with all the constraints of the kind of life that she had chosen with the Prime Minister. I, I liked her a lot. She she used to come to the house. She came one once, and and uh, she would be going to some. And she felt very comfortable dropping off one of the kids and and going off and 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 doing whatever it was that she she had to do. But and the book was, um, I think you know I reread it when I was writing my book, and it's not a bad book. It's you know and she sold did, a lot of copies. Sold a lot, and she did her own writing. Mm -hmm which uh, is, you know, she, she's, she has a natural talent for writing. Hmm. Um, I was sort of hoping that uh, she would do more writing, and as you probably know, she has. Indeed. And her, uh, the book ab about that she wrote, the sort of, I think, final autobiography, um, although I, I saw her, um, I saw her in BC uh, maybe five, four years ago, and I suggest that she should write a novel because she really does have a talent. Hmm. You, uh, your career uh, continues to take you to places that a little five-year-old girl in jail in Hungary, I suspect, <laughs> never thought it would go. And I want to talk about your days on corporate boards because eventually you started hanging out with people the likes of David Brinkley and William F. Buckley and Henry Kissinger and Gianni Agnelli, the Italian magnate, Paul Volcker, Zbigniew Brzezinski, George F. Will, Margaret Thatcher. At any point in any of those meetings, did you look around the room and say, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, frequently. Frequently. <laughs> and yet you were. I, it, I really, really enjoyed those meetings. I mean, you, you're really talking about only one of the boards that, that I was on. Most of the boards I was on were not quite so elevated in terms of the uh, this people. Is Hollinger, this is Hollinger, Conrad Black's company. Yes, well, it's, it's actually his advisory board. Okay. And, uh, and I loved those meetings. They were fascinating. The people around the table were, all the people whose names you've mentioned, were really, really interesting to, to listen to about um, issues of the day, foreign policy, and I, I felt privileged to be able to be there and listen to it. Um, it. I did not speak a lot. I asked the occasional question. Mm. And, uh, and uh, Mrs. Thatcher took me to the washroom once because I had, I had uh, broken a leg and uh, I was in a wheelchair. And uh, she said, oh, come on, let me take you. And <laughs> so she wheeled me off to the washroom once. 
Um, but you know what? It was, it was, I was very impressed with that group of people. And, and with Conrad Black, the way he handled those meetings and other meetings, Conrad is, is one of those people who, who's all, is still able to come up with a word that I vaguely know, but don't quite, and have to go look it up. Mm -hmm. And I used, at Hollinger board meetings, I actually used to write down the occasional word and phrase that he used because... Um, they were impressive. Why he is impressive. I need to ask you now about another superstar in your life that we haven't talked about yet, and that would be your husband of 46 years, Julian Porter. Um, how do I put this? Marriage had never been a really successful thing in your family, right? Is that okay to say? I, I think that would be... Your mother had how many? Um, more, more than she'd like to admit. Uh, three? Yes. At least three? Um, at least. At least three, okay. And yet you've been married to this guy, by all accounts, quite happily, for 46 years. Yes. What's the secret? He's great. He's funny, and, uh, and I enjoy... You know, we, we talk about everything. We have uh, great conversations. Um, he's very engaged with politics. He's very engaged with art, as you know. Indeed, he was in that chair talking about this, his book. Yes, and, uh, well, and he talk about, loves art. Talk about politics for a second, because he, in 1985, ran to be a progressive conservative member of the Ontario legislature in a riding about five minutes from the studio. Indeed. And he lost. It, totally. Uh, in hindsight, are you happy that he lost? Delighted. <laughs> Really, um, he, he was he was not not happy. No, um, who we, runs to lose? No, no he wanted no, to win. We had a couple of dogs at the time, and and he, and, and he used to uh, he used to take them for long walks to kind of recover from having lost them, and he he would let them poo on on various people's lawns, <laughs> knowing they hadn't voted for him, including people who had come up and said, Julian, you know, it's a wonderful you're running, I support you all the way, and then they didn't vote for him. Julian lost our block. That, that you live on. Yes. Well, that was a pretty good election for the Liberal. He lost to a guy named Ian Scott, yes. who turned out to be maybe the second best attorney general of all this time. This is true. But, so, but, you know, but no Julian shame actually would have been attorney general had he, had he won. As his father was. As his father was. And I think, mm -hmm. I think he's always regretted a little bit that he didn't. But I, I don't know. I mean, we've had, we've had many of these conversations. We went off to Europe, and he spent a fair bit of time licking his wounds as we traveled around, and he was you know, expounding on various artists, and periodically he would look a little sad. But you know what he did before that? Well, I know this because I read it in your book. He went to Ian Scott's campaign headquarters yes. on election night and hugged him yes. to congratulate him for yes. winning. That's extraordinary. Yes. Did you know you were seeing something extraordinary as it happened? Um, Julian liked Ian very much and respected him. They were, uh, they had known each other before, so it was, so the elections, that, that election was not the only time they met. Um, but he's a very generous man, so he doesn't, um, he doesn't hold grudges unless somebody attacks his wife. And then he's a miserable Oh, man. he can be very nasty. As he should be. <laughs> I want to spend our remaining moments talking about your company, Key Porter. What is the status of Key Porter today? Sadly, it is a thing of the past. Why? Um, I, I wanted to write a book um, that I couldn't write while working full time. And uh, it was a book about the Holocaust in Hungary. And I really, I, it was a book I needed to write. I needed to understand um, how it had unfolded and why uh, the people I had always considered uh, wonderful and heroic, as we mentioned earlier, uh, became allies of the Nazis and, uh, and really aided the deportation of Hungary's Jewish citizens to uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, where most of them perished. And I really needed to write that book. So I was already starting on it, and I realized I had to get out of the book business. I sold the company to a gentleman by the name of Harold Fenn, who had a distribution warehousing operation, and he thought he would like to have a publishing company. And uh, shortly after that, I quit. So really, um, the company itself went on for a while uh, with Harold and his, uh, and his sons, and then 
it went bankrupt. I mean, the, the entire enterprise, HP, Fenn, went bankrupt. Um, and uh, Keyporter was just a small, smallish part of that larger operation. And sadly, it didn't make it. How difficult is it, as you look back on your life, because everybody who starts something wants to leave that kind yes. of a legacy, of course, and, and as you've said, it, it's no longer there. How do you I deal with that? I feel sad about it. Mm. Um, I still miss, um, I miss a lot of the people. I, I was enormously fortunate, again, in that company, in, mm. in uh, having really superb people. Writing, you spend a lot of time alone, whereas in publishing, you have almost no time to yourself. Very different, and I miss I miss um, I miss opening a new manuscript that I hadn't yet just received, mm. and reading the first page and going, "Wow, I miss that." I mean, I do that with books now. I miss the smell even of a fresh, just printed book. It's got a certain smell to it that I miss. Um, I miss going to Frankfurt. Um, I used to love the Frankfurt International Book Fair and seeing all my friends from other countries. And I have stayed in, in touch with many of them too, but you know, it's different because we don't share. We used to meet over specific manuscripts and writers whose work we admired and exchange ideas and, and exchange, in fact, writers. You know, if you do this book, we'll do the, your, your book. Mm -hmm. you, you do, if you do Farley Mowat this year, we're going to take that Norwegian author and we're going to publish him here. Um, so that kind of camaraderie, it's, uh, I miss that. Well, the way you have described it is just extraordinary. And those stories and more are all in here. And you know everybody, Anna Porter, I got to <laughs> say, you know everybody. I don't know if there's an index in the back of the book because I didn't check, but you know everybody. There must be a thousand names in that index. Anyway, the name of this book is, in other words, How I Fell in Love with Canada, One Book at a Time, and I'm so glad it's brought you to our studio tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here again. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.